Harry Truman and Joseph Stalin led their nations from World War victory in 1945 through seven years of tense confrontation. By 1953, it was time for a new generation of cold warriors to take command. In Washington, the changing of the guard came democratically. The people speak and their verdict a landslide victory for Dwight D. Eisenhower, elected president with the greatest popular vote ever given a White House candidate. The hero of D-Day, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, became the first Republican president in 20 years. On the campaign trail, Eisenhower pledged to take a hard line with the Soviet Union and to bring an end to the war in Korea. You have summoned me on behalf of millions of your fellow Americans to lead a great crusade for freedom in America and freedom in the world. As president, Eisenhower continued the policy of containment, but his administration's new look defense strategy relied more heavily on air power and nuclear weapons. Deploying an effective nuclear arsenal was easier and cheaper than maintaining a massive land army. Eisenhower could defend the nation, cut taxes, and curb inflation all at the same time. In the expression of the day, it was a bigger bang for the buck. The new look was not just economical, it was aggressive. The White House adopted a policy of massive retaliation to deter Soviet aggression. It stated that if the Soviet Union invaded Western Europe, the U.S. would respond by launching more than 3,000 nuclear missiles against every major urban, industrial, and military target throughout the communist world. Experts estimated that such an attack would kill 285 million people. President Eisenhower refused to consider options that stopped short of total war. But even as the Eisenhower White House was refining its Cold War strategy, news from Moscow that Joseph Stalin had died dramatically altered the playing field. The official cause was a stroke, but many suspected poison. Without a plan for succession, a collective leadership assumed control of the Soviet Union. Almost immediately, they extended an olive branch to the West. Speaking for the party, Georgi Malenkov declared, we stand as we have always stood for peaceful coexistence of the two systems. Coming from the avowed enemy of capitalism, peaceful coexistence was a radical notion. Was this just Soviet propaganda, or was the new Kremlin really different than the old? In an address dubbed Chance for Peace, Eisenhower called on the Soviets to demonstrate they had truly broken with Stalin's legacy. I know of only one question upon which progress waits. It is this. What is the Soviet Union ready to do? Whatever the answer is, let it be plainly spoken. Again, we say the hunger for peace is too great. The hour in history too late for any government to mock men's hopes with mere words and promises and gestures. Before the Soviets could respond, the president's seemingly genuine offer was contradicted by his own Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. He ridiculed the idea of peaceful coexistence as a ploy to divide the Western allies, adding, we are not dancing to any Russian tune. The chance for peace, if it ever existed, was squandered, and U.S.-Soviet relations continued to vacillate between measured tolerance and outright disdain. Two years later, in 1955, both nations were seeking opportunities to relax Cold War tensions. They met face to face in Geneva, Switzerland, for the first time since the end of World War II. Some 11 years ago, I came to Europe with an army, a navy, an air force, with a single purpose, to destroy Nazism. 
this time, I come armed with something uh, far more powerful, the goodwill of America, the great hopes of America, the aspirations of America for peace. Americans got their first good look at the new Kremlin powers at the summit. There was Soviet Premier Nikolai Buganin, Defense Minister Marshal Zhukov, and the outspoken head of the Soviet Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev. During discussions, Eisenhower suggested a program he called Open Skies that would permit air reconnaissance over both countries. Bulganin and Zhukov were receptive to the idea, but Khrushchev quickly denounced the idea as a bold espionage plot. After two years of uncertainty, it was clear that Nikita Khrushchev was now the top man in Moscow. Khrushchev's reason for refusing open skies was simple. His nation had been threatening the West with nuclear rockets it simply did not have, and bombs it could not deliver onto American soil. These military shortcomings were a closely held secret in the Kremlin but they would not remain secret for long. On July 4, 1957, a Lockheed U-2 spy plane made its inaugural flight over the Soviet Union. From an altitude of 70,000 feet, the U-2 captured stunningly clear images of its target. For four years, U-2 flights gathered revealing intelligence about Soviet military installations and missile deployments. But President Eisenhower feared the inevitable. Sooner or later, he said, one of these things is going to get shot down. 